I'm Oliver Swess, and you're listening to Five Minutes of Silence, the podcast dedicated to exploring the silence of places, people, and everyday objects. Throughout our lives, we hear sounds constantly. We can't just turn off our hearing in the way that we can shut our eyes to stop seeing. Our ears are always on and there is always some sound that we are processing even when it's very, very quiet. Our relationship to sound, silence and noise starts in the womb, even before we are born. To me, this is a big part of what makes silence and sound so fascinating. The fact that we have all formed our own individual ideas about sound and silence. How these relationships change during our lives. And the many different ways we humans have found to express what this thing called silence means to us throughout history and across different cultures. Acousticians are scientists who dedicate most of their working time to researching sound and noise. I think it's safe to assume that they also must have thought about silence way more than many people, including me. And with their education based on mathematics and physics, I was hoping that an acoustician could give me some definite and science-based answers about silence. So for this episode, I got in touch with an acoustician and asked him, how would you define silence? I would define silence as the absence of, of sound. That's Kurt Hoichi. He's a senior scientist working at the Acoustics and Noise Control Lab at EMPA, the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Science and Technology. I mean, there are different levels, sort of, of silence. Absolute silence is not existing. This is more of a concept. Wherever you are, even in the most silent lab, there is still a very, very small, a tiny variation in pressure that is below the hearing threshold. So from a perceptual point of view, there's nothing. But if you would measure this with a, a very accurate instrument, you, there is no such thing as absolute dead silence. This is probably only somewhere in, in outer space. So there you go. Absolute silence is the absence of noise and pressure. But what's the difference then to regular silence, the silence we all refer to in our everyday lives? Usually it's the hearing threshold that is taken as the limit. And as soon as the signal is below that hearing threshold, then you can consider it or you can say this is silent now. I also wanted to know if silence, according to his experience, is even something people enjoy or look for. And at what point does sound turn into noise? Almost all the time there is at least a tiny uh, signal that you can capture. I would even say if outdoors there is nothing that can be heard, this is sort of frightening or this is not a convenient situation. We are so much used to some background noise. Uh, even if you are high up in the mountains, you hear a cowbell, whatever. And this, at least to, to my understanding, this is something that is nice. I mean, it's a soundscape. It makes the environment um, attractive. But of course, then when you come closer to urban spaces, it turns into noise. Noise is then something that is unwanted. It is, it's, it's sort of just a background, a noise floor that may then even be as high as that it, it starts to be annoying or, or that it can cause health problems. I mean, in our definition, the, the levels above which we experience serious problems, uh, be it annoyance or, or then also that sleep is disturbed, uh, starts around 60, 60 dBA. For non-experts, 60 dBA, which he is referring to, is about as loud as my voice would be if I was standing one meter away from you. We heard Kurt mention that noise can cause health problems. I wanted to know how he and his team do research in this field and whether the way they do their studies and experiments has changed in the recent years. Our tradition is in, in physics. So 
say in the last uh, 50 years or so, we understood our job, our task here to come up with prediction models that allow us to tell how noisy it is, say, at the facade of a building. And I can say that we did quite a good job in this, so we are quite accurate now in the prediction of the noise level. However, reflecting why we're doing this, we do this because we want to predict the reaction of the people, of the inhabitants, people that are exposed to that noise. And here then we identified this interface. I mean, what, what is physically present at, say, the window of a resident and then what that noise that is there present creates as a reaction in the person. Uh, it was clear that this is still not well understood. And so this is a main focus area in our lab. So we try to better understand how people respond to noise and uh, also what signal properties might be more annoying than others. So things that are equally loud could be more or less annoying. Definitely, definitely, yeah. And to test this, do you just invite people over and give them different sounds to listen to? Yes, exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. This is the key thing. As soon as you bring in the human being into the equation, then you have to perform experiments with people. So we are setting up now a virtual reality lab where we can create any arbitrary scene and then we, I mean, we have done preliminary experiments with this, but then we can invite people and then we play different scenarios and then people can rate, is this more annoying than that in, in an A-B comparison? And so we can learn what is it that people are more annoyed and what people respond to as, as very unpleasant. This interview was, of course, also a good excuse for me to go record some proper silence. As one would expect, IMPA has some very soundproof rooms on their campus. Tell me, Kurt, what's so special about this room? The room is designed in such a way that it isolates or that it blocks vibrations that are around in the building. Yeah, I mean, we are in a big building and all the time there are sources that excite the building structure to vibration. And the first thing is in designing such a, a low noise room is that you isolate it from the rest of the building in order not to capture these vibrations. That would then make also the walls, uh, floor and roof of that room to vibrate and this would, would radiate as a loudspeaker would then radiate sound. This has to be avoided. So this is one thing. The second thing is that you cover all the room surfaces with absorptive material. You try to avoid reflections that usually occur in a regular room where you have then in, a, in an ordinary room, you also have then sound paths by the, the walls and, and floors and, and so on. This is what we refer to as a reflection. So this is also avoided. It is on one hand, a room that is nicely isolated. So it is pretty silent in there. But the second thing is that it is absorbing sound. So everything that, that is created in that room will not create reverberation. It's a very dry environment. And maybe for someone who has never been in such a room before, what does one experience? Is there anything special that you notice as you walk in there? As you enter, you first of all experience that it is pretty silent. So there's almost no noise that can be noticed. And the second experience is that you sort of get an irritation. Uh, some people report this feeling as they have a, a pressure in their head. And this is mainly due to the fact that this is a new experience. The eye still recognizes this is a room and we have learned uh, whenever we see a room, we also expect reflection. So tiny noise that is present is then reflected by the walls. There is some, some, some amount of reverberation. This is totally missing there. So this creates this irritation. But you can get used to that. So when you work in, in these rooms from time to time, then you get used to that. So it, it's no longer any, any special experience as you enter. 
And from this, I gather that you don't use this room regularly to de-stress or just to block out all the noise in your life, right? <laughs> you could try to do that, but um, I, I guess the total absence of, of any sound is not what makes you feel comfortable. You said that this room is pretty silent. How quiet are the signals that you can measure in this room? The limitation is the self-noise of the microphone. We do have expensive and uh, state-of-the-art microphones, but they all have their self-noise that is typically even a little bit above the hearing threshold. So this is sort of the limiting factor. I mean, the environment is good, but self-noise sort of determines how low we can measure sounds in that room. So basically, what Kurt is telling us here is that if you listen to the recording of this room and if you turn up your headphones really, really high, what you'll be hearing is not exactly the room, but actually it's more my microphone and its own self-noise. After my talk with Kurt, we headed downstairs to record the silence. I was surprised that this anechoic chamber, as it's officially called, was located on the second floor in a corridor next to some offices and not in the basement or somewhere else a bit more remote. As you step in, the sensation is exactly as Kurt described. You just do not hear anything. It's really disorienting. Of course, you hear your clothes rustling, your footsteps and everything else that creates sound. But there's just no reflection whatsoever. You don't know where you are. I even did the old hand clap test to check the reverberation, like this, and all I heard was just a faint clap from my hands. I mean, it's exactly the way he described, but it's really strange to experience it nonetheless. I set up my microphone, hit record, and then we both stepped out and Kurt shut that huge door. So without much further ado, here's five minutes of silence from Impas Anechoic Chamber.
Thank you for listening to five minutes of silence from Impasse and Echoic Chamber. How did that room sound to you? Was there anything special that you noticed? How would you compare this silence to the silence of my washing machine from last episode? For the next episode, we'll be listening to the silence of an object again. I found that setting up face-to-face interviews and recording on site during a pandemic comes with its own set of challenges that are not entirely easy to handle. So for the time being, I'd rather focus on creating episodes in my studio again. I would like to thank Kortoichi and his team for their time and letting me record in their labs. It was a real treat for me. Thanks again. If while listening to this episode you came up with ideas or suggestions for people, objects or places that would be interesting to feature on 5 Minutes of Silence, please reach out to me. You can find 5 Minutes of Silence on Instagram, YouTube or Facebook. All the links are in the episode's description. Until next time.